Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Matt Miller. There's a lot of geopolitical news mm -hmm. happening, happened. Happened. A lot of macroeconomic news, though, as well. Yes, absolutely. We're going to go through it all when we talk about the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry right now. We're going to speak in just a moment with Jeff Sherman, Deputy CIO at Double Line Capital, and get his thoughts on credit. And we're also going to discuss with Jeff the implications of the Federal Reserve's pause and where rates might go from here, Matt. Also, as we weigh the next moves from central banks, we're going to discuss one Fidelity ETF that can be a one-stop shop for fixed income exposure. And Matt, as always, Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence is with us now. He's taken a look at the flows. Eric, what do you got? Katie, Matt, thank you very much. So the big takeaway from the flows this week is that that move into equity ETFs that we've been loving to watch over the last five weeks has stalled out, basically. If you look at that white number under one week, that's negative 1.5 billion. That's all ETFs. So basically, flows were came in, but they also offset by outflows. That's not good. And equity ETFs saw 2 billion of outflows. SPY is seeing a lot. That's good. But again, it was offset. RSP, that's also the equal weighted ETF, has been having a nice run lately. But again, offset by other things. Also, number seven, TQQQ. You like to see flows there. That's that sort of retail trading crowd buying the dip. Let's look at the outflows over the past week. And here's where you can see a lot of the bad news, right? So the queue is seeing outflows. BBEU is interesting, right? We've seen this whole international trade all year, which I've been skeptical of, and now it is unwinding. JP Morgan is selling out of BBEU and buying into the U.S. So I think we'll see more of that probably within these flows uh, over the next couple of weeks. Now let's take a look at this FOMO drought indicator that we introduced uh, about a month ago, which we think is very important in determining where investors' mindset is, right? This is the gap between flows into equity ETFs versus flows into fixed income ETFs. When it's above, it means more into equity, right? Below, more into fixed income. This would be FOMO drought right here, right? But it's coming back. People are actually getting excited by the returns in stocks. So if you look here, this is all equity ETFs now have taken in more than all fixed income. That's good. We declare the drought over. However, if you uh, break it out to US, US equity ETFs still well below fixed income ETFs. So I'm probably not willing to call the drought completely over until that equity number passes fixed income, but it's good. It's definitely some good news. For equity investors or equity <laughs> investor lovers. Yes. yes. Overall all right. sentiment, if you will. Yes, sentiment for the equity market. Thanks, Eric. Joining our conversation now is Jeff Sherman, deputy CIO at Double Line Capital. And of course, you're not an equity guy. Um, what do you make of the outperformance of fixed income in terms of in ETF terms? So yeah, I mean, looking at, at the chart there, what I, what I see there is essentially what we had the low in yields once again, right? For, if you look at where that bottom, that chart right there, what I see is that was post the uh, banking crisis that we saw, we saw a big rally in yields. And so yields have been marching upwards, albeit they've stalled as of late, um, you know, especially on the back end of the curve on 10s and 30s. Uh, but I think some of that is just seeing negative returns in the short term over fixed income. And it, it is still a FOMO trade as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen activity at Double Line. Uh, we've seen flows uh, both on the mutual fund and ETF side uh, into our fixed income ETFs as well as our equity ETFs. So uh, in general, I think we're seeing flows across the board as people are reassessing risk profiles. We had a massive run in, in the queues, as, as Eric was pointing out uh, as well. And so you're starting to see some of that kind of people look to allocate elsewhere today. It feels like all of this comes back to the Fed, that this is still a very macro-driven market across asset classes. And when you think about, you know, equity ETFs maybe starting to overtake the inflows into bond ETFs, a lot of that ties back to this idea that maybe the Fed is finally done, that maybe we saw the last rate hike, even though we've heard to the contrary from Jerome Powell himself. What's the double line view on where the Fed goes from here and what that means for risk assets? Yeah, I, I think it, it's very tough to call right now. I mean, we think the Fed should be done at this point in time. Let's uh, let's continue the pause for an, uh, at least throughout the summer uh, to let the market digest what's happened thus far. And so the old saying in the, in the market is that the Fed hikes until something breaks. And we did see a break in the system back in March, right? Uh, we saw what it did to some of the banking system. And so we haven't really seen the ramifications of all that yet. And so I find it curious to see not only Jay Powell, but the majority of Fed governors who vote for the dot plot say that rates should be at least 50 basis points higher before the end of the year. And so I think some of that, you, know, you set a pause in the, in, in the rate hiking cycle leading to equity flows. I think maybe potentially some investors are thinking that you're going to see negative performance in bonds because rates continue to push up. But at this stage, what we've seen is that 
Again, 500 basis points is a lot. I think we all agree with that. And I think just the longer that the Fed stays at this level, I think it continues to put pressure on the banking system. It wakes people up to realize they're not getting market rates in their deposits. And look, Janet Yellen will sell you T-bills all day long with a five <laughs> handle on them, right? And she needs to, right? They've been replenishing the TGA as well. But if you look at the back end of the curve, 10-year Treasury is roughly in the range it's been in for the last like seven plus months, right? Since mid-November at least. And so ultimately, as a bond investor, what that means, if you'd have bought this seven months ago, yields haven't changed. You've had a little bit of volatility, but you've earned carry the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what people are realizing too, look at how deeply inverted the curve is. Whether you use twos, tens, you use three month T-bills to tens, we're getting back to these extreme levels again. And so to me, it signals that there's a nervousness with the bond market and that investors are saying that given the macroeconomic data, maybe it makes sense to allocate to some of these longer dated bonds. Yeah, and so I looked at TOTL, which is your biggest uh, active ETF by far. Yeah. And you look in port and you look at a, a history, it looks like you're going into securitized debt yep. and you're going out of government debt. Could you just explain that trade for, for us? Yeah, the, the, the majority of that securitized trade, uh, the, well, there's two, there's two legs to it. One is some of the credit exposure on the securitized things, things like non-agency RMBS, things like CLO, uh, that we think are really high quality at this point in the cycle. Think about it a year ago, Eric. If I had told you that you know, mortgage rates are going from 3% to 7%, I think we'd all would have forecasted a significant decline in housing. But we've seen inventory, and we've seen people just having low rates stay there. But what's happened in the agency mortgage market is that uh, on that side of the trade is that the agency mortgage market has been one where you've lost a natural buyer. Who was this natural buyer? It was these regional and community banks. And so it's put some pressure on spreads. In fact, a month ago or maybe three weeks ago, mortgage spreads got to some of their widest levels that we've seen in like 15 years. Um, and this was, again, that, that high that we saw uh, at that point was because Fannie and Freddie were potentially going out of business, right? And so what you're seeing is there's a very good opportunity from a government guaranteed asset. So you're seeing that we're pairing those two trades together. Yes, we've been selling some of the treasuries because of the cheapness of the, uh, of the agency mortgage market, but we also like some of these other credit sectors because they have shorter duration, uh, they have a, a relatively shorter spread duration than something like corporate bonds today. And so for the relative value you see there, it is attractive. Lastly on that too, what we've also done within that treasury portfolio is rotate the duration out a little bit to kind of offset that move of having a shorter duration on the mortgage and that credit exposure. So in general, what it is, it's trying to be active. It's thinking about where we are on the cycle and balancing the portfolio and risk both on the government guaranteed side as well as the credit side. I want to get more into that, where we are in the cycle, because there's a Fed paper out now saying the share of non-financial firms in financial distress has reached a level that's higher than during most of the previous tightening episodes since the 70s. So what does that mean for you or that portfolio? Jeff Sherman here with us. We're going to zero in on the corporate credit market next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF brief where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with a Bitcoin futures ETF. Of course, we've been talking so much about BlackRock's spot Bitcoin ETF filing last week. But interestingly, it's also fueled money to go into Bitto. Of course, that is the ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF based on futures it took in 65 billion dollars last week that is the or 65 million rather that's the biggest inflow in about a year so blackrock breathing fresh life even into these bitcoin futures products so we'll continue to watch that but let's turn now to the equity market really interesting piece of research out from athanasios and crew over at bloomberg intelligence basically looking at where money is going in leveraged equity funds as you can see in that blue line the short leveraged products have been taking in more money relative to the long bet. So that could be hedging, that could be a sign that maybe the conviction isn't there behind the equity rally. It's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. But let's also talk about cash. I'm thinking about Vcash here. This is Vanguard's short uh, cash product. Basically it's ultra short debt ETF. It's actually one of the biggest losers on the year in terms of outflows. Very rare to see a Vanguard product out there, but really speaks to how that big appetite for cash that we've been tracking for so long, it's starting to fade now, Matt. 
All right, very interesting stuff indeed. Katie, let's get back to Double Lines. Uh, Deputy CIO Jeff Sherman talking to us about their portfolio and um, the effects of uh, the Titans' monetary policy and, and really a higher uh, share of non-financial firms failing. H how do you look at that? Is the recession imminent? I don't know if it's imminent, but it definitely seems in the cards over the next 12 months. I mean, if you look at the macroeconomic indicators, you know, pick your favorite one. Um, I, I can only find two uh, indicators that I follow that are showing still signs of life in the economy. And I, I see some horrific prints and things like the LEI. Right. What, what, what are they? Oh, you want the positive. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the positive things are ISM services. Um, they're still expanding. Uh, unfortunately, they're expanding at a very slow rate at this point. But that is one of the things, given we're a service-based economy, that's a strong indicator. And it's somewhat contemporaneous, right? It's not massively lagged. And then you have the labor market, which we know is notoriously a lagged variable. And so the labor market seems to be continuing to deliver, at least on the smaller medium enterprise and some of the service areas. We always see the large cap names are, are having significant layoffs at this point. So uh, I don't get too excited about labor at this point, just given it's late in the cycle. Uh, but you're talking about you know, some of the stress in the marketplace. I think the, the biggest place that's seen this today is the leverage loan market. And not shockingly, it is a floating rate asset. And so when you think about the buildup of debt, well, all of a sudden, you have 500 basis points more on coupon because they reset off of SOFR, which is key to the Fed funds rate. But if you think about investment-grade corporate bonds or high-yield bonds, well, the bulk of this stuff got refinanced back in 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. So that weighted average cost of capital of these firms is still relatively low, right? So if you don't have a need to come to the market, it's extremely low. And so there's a reason you're seeing this divergence between the lower-quality loan names and some of the lower-quality high-yield is because those actually haven't had to reset yet. But for those that are trafficking in these markets, you know, we prefer a, a higher quality. Look, I'm okay with some single B risk in the portfolio and double B because, again, some of this stuff ultimately, you know, it doesn't have pressure on it, right? And so this is what happens when you have a rapid hiking cycle and these 500 basis points aren't in all parts of the economy today. We see it in housing, right? We see it in loans. And I, I, if I'm most concerned about a part of the market that's showing stress, it is the leveraged loan market. Well, I want to talk specifically about high yield because we've been trying to compare maybe this recession that's coming to past recessions. We heard uh, some really interesting comments from Michael Collins over at PGM last week. Let's take a listen. The mistake a lot of uh, folks are making, Lisa, is they're looking at all the historical relationships, right? And they're looking at high yield spreads in a typical recession go out to 800 basis points or 1,000 basis points. And in today's world, that would be a 15% yield, right, which is, which is kind of Armageddon. They expect high yield defaults to hit 10%. Uh, that's because they're looking at the old models, looking at some of the past recessions where you had a lot of leverage, where you had a lot of excesses and credit buildups, you do not have that now. So, so our our mantra is, you know, 600 spread on the high yield market is the new 800, right? If you get into the fives, you're buying high yield. So, 600 basis points is the new 800 basis points. 500 basis points sounds like Michael Collins is buying five uh, high yield. We're at 430 right now. What's your thinking on basically the valuations in high yield? Yeah, I think 600 is the buy. I think 800 is more this recession. And I, I don't think there's a new model out there. At the end of the day, you're pricing default risk, right? Um, but I think it stems back. And I think where Michael could be right here is what we just talked about, right? If the recession happens right now today, if it's imminent right now, these companies don't have to refinance the debt. The wall, the maturity wall, as we call it, is extended out at least another year, if not 18 plus months. And so usually it's those maturity walls that cause a default cycle, right? Because the debt has to roll over. And when does it roll over? It roll, or what does it roll over? It rolls over at market rates, right? So you have these companies right now that are paying a below market rate because, again, they issued the debt uh, 18 months to, to like 30 months ago. And so ultimately, I think, you know, there's a reason that there's this pressure in spreads and spreads are tighter than they are well, usually at this point in the cycle. Uh, but again, I think that at the end of the day, if you start to see the recession, you start to see more of this stuff, you're going to get a spread widening. And just look at the last episode of spread widening and high yield. It went on 100 in like two weeks, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I don't get excited about 430. 430 to me is not a level to buy. It's a level to re-sculpt the portfolio and maybe move up in quality a little bit. 
But look, if he's going to hide out in triple, I'm uh, sorry, double Bs in that area, yeah, but they're very tight spreads. You, you have a 300 handle, right? So ultimately, I, I think that there, there is no new mantra in the world today. You've got to look at spreads, and ultimately, the higher that cash stays, the higher yield stay, that people will look at that and say, look, is eight and eight, eight and a half yield or 830 yield today, is that enough to really take default risk when I can get these T-bills at five and a half percent? Perfect segue. There is a uh, ETF out there, XCCC, which is all triple C. That is yielding 14%. So, you know, tell me why someone like me shouldn't just put one or two percent of my portfolio in this because look at the spread there. Yeah. Isn't that enough? Well, 14% yield uh, isn't enough spread, I would say, today. And it depends. I mean, ultimately, triple C's usually have a 20 handle in a recession, right? And so what does that mean? Repricing, okay, you know, it's a, if it's a three to five year asset, you're talking about being down 20, 25% on that. So your carry helps you some, Eric, but it doesn't get you through it. Secondly, if you look historically, the, the, when you talk about triple C, the way that the ratings agencies view that is that it has like an 85% probability of default over the next five years. So it's all about trading, Eric. I know you're a good trader. So again, if you want to put on the trade, that's great. But if you like that and you think there's not a default environment, I got a better one for you. It's not, I don't know about an ETF on it, but it's the triple C bank loan market. Today it has a 20 handle yield on it, wow. right? You know why? No one thinks you're getting 20 over the full cycle of those loans, right? <laughs> so you're gonna have to have a good lawyer. You're gonna have, to have a good workout. But again, if you want to trade it, feel free. All right, maybe we'll keep an eye out for the double line version of that uh, trade there. But Jeff, really appreciate it. That is Jeff Sherman, Deputy CIO over at Double Line. Still head on this program. We're going to drill down more into bonds with Greg Friedman. He is head of ETF management and strategy at Fidelity. That's next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Matt Miller alongside Katie Greifeld. And Eric Valchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence. He's back with us now. Yes. He's back, yes. thank goodness, for today's drill down where he's going to focus on one ETF. Eric, what do you got? Katie, today we have, uh, we're going to stick with the credit theme, okay? FBND, it's the Fidelity Total Bond ETF. As you can see here, it's actively managed. We also tag it over there. So it's an active bond ETF. The fee on this uh, is 36 basis points. You can't see it, but that's what it says. And that's good because it, it has helped this fund get 4.1 billion. Most active funds that are priced below 40 bips have sold well over the past couple years, and this one is no exception. So 4.1 billion, this goal of this fund is to beat the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, right? That's a goal of a lot of active bond managers. Let's look at cross-section of the bonds and what you get here. A couple things to point out here. You're gonna get a wide variety of stuff in here, right? It's not just uh, plain vanilla. Your corporate is gonna be about 40%, government 33%. Etc. You got some mortgages in there. And then the uh, composite rating, you do get some high yield in here, about 15% B and double B. Uh, so you need to know that's a little extra risk in there. And that has actually helped the CTF. If we look at the performance of FBND versus the AG, as well as I threw in two popular active ETFs, it's done very well. I think that little bit of high yield has helped uh, among some other things. Um, and that's good. That helps explain that 4.1 billion. Um, Katie, so if that's, you know, outperformance is key for these active funds. Low cost also helps, and that's why you have such a, a successful fund here. Eric, thank you. And joining us now to talk about this ETF, I'm thrilled to say, is Greg Friedman. He is head of ETF management and strategy over at Fidelity, here to talk about FBND, which, as Eric just pointed out, has been handily outperforming, which, as Eric laid out, is the holy grail of a lot of bond managers. When you think about, you know, those uh, that outperformance that you've been able to put on the board, what has been the biggest components if you drill down into the holdings of this fund? Well, first of all, it's how we approach the fund. It's a team approach. We have three main factors or thematics that we're doing within that. It's multi-sector, it's risk control, and a contrarian type of view of how do we choose value. Um, you know, Fidelity's obviously been well known historically for equities, but we have a huge and rich history on fixed income. We were 400 professionals. We manage 1.7 trillion in assets uh, for fixed income, and this is just one of those products that we've had a great track record, uh, performance, and we've really looked at it, uh, as Eric said, of how do we put in 80% you know, of investment grade plus 20% of more of the high yield that gives it the little extra uh, juice it needs that we able to achieve those performance numbers. How do you look at I mean, the default rates, 
coming up, a, a, a potentially imminent recession. Um, do you position yourself differently for that? Not particularly, because it's always been an approach where we say, you know, let's look at sectors. So let's look, have a global universe that we can invest in, highly integrated in U.S. securities, U.S. governments, securities, et cetera. We do have a portion in non-U.S. equities, uh, but we don't change that, that strategy. Um, we want to be risk control, which is the second factor I spoke about. How do we get that right balance between risk and, and return? And then thirdly, you know, on the contrarian, you know, there's value out there. How do we find that value? So we're not taking the active bets based upon you know, what you just described. It's really a, a methodology that we stick to. And how does that work inside Fidelity? Most people know Fidelity as the active mutual fund company. Um, I remember when Bill Gross and Pimco launched Be a Bond, they said this is kind of like the best ideas of the total return fund. How does this relate to the broader active bond mutual funds at Fidelity? Yeah, you know, we have a mutual fund with the same total bond strategy, same portfolio manager, same team approach. So we're managing this in the same manner that we manage the, the mutual fund in today. So it's very consistent with our standards, our policies, and our procedures. And I do want to get your uh, thoughts on the active non-transparent wrapper, of course, that unlike traditional ETFs, you really only see the holdings once a quarter, similar to a mutual fund. It's been interesting. This was billed as the next big thing for ETFs. So we really haven't seen the asset gathering. What's your current thinking on whether, you know, maybe this kind of missed the mark, this wrapper, or is this something that could actually take off? We still think it has a lot of legs and a lot of applications. Now, the challenge is we're limited to what we can put into this wrapper. So the, because of the exemptive relief we receive from the SEC, we can only do U.S. equities. So that eliminates fixed income, theme of our show today. <laughs> it eliminates non-U.S. equity, options, futures, and derivatives. So all the applications or all the technologies have worked very well. We've seen great spreads, great depth, great quotes. But because you can only, you're only limited to U.S. equity, some of the applications are limited. So a lot of the firms, I think, have bypassed the semi-transparent technology and gone right to fully transparent. Um, we still think there's a lot of places where semi-transparent makes sense with liquidity concerns, certain market uh, spaces, certain um, different asset classes, it makes sense. But we're not there yet because we haven't gotten the uh, uh, needed approvals from the SEC. Greg, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Greg Friedman of Fidelity talking to us uh, about uh, FBND as well as ANTS. Thank you very much <laughs> for that. A quick programming note. Markets are closing early next Monday because of the 4th of July holiday. So we'll be back next Wednesday, July 5th. This is Bloomberg.